In terms of movies about racing, Days of Thunder is the greatest ever made, and the greatest that ever will be. No other film has had such a lasting effect on its sport, while also perfectly capturing its most exciting era. You want proof? You're hearing from it. That movie's the whole reason I got into NASCAR. When I was nine, I walked into that theater not knowing a thing about racing. All I was interested in was Thomas the Tank Engine and the sinking of the Titanic. One hour and 47 minutes later, I still liked those things, but I also couldn't wait for Days Daytona. I wasn't the only one either. Nearly three decades later, the fictional cars from the movie are accepted as throwback schemes, alongside paint schemes honoring real drivers and teams. Several parodies abound, from Kyle Busch, who adopted Rowdy Burns' nickname and his car number, it, to The Simpsons. That racer transformed me into the twisted creature you see before you. I'll never race again. The fact is, Paramount Pictures knew what they were doing when they marketed this movie. The five iconic paint schemes from the film were licensed to multiple companies, many of them represented on the cars themselves. Racing Champions die-cast cars were sold at Exxon gas stations, a cross-promotion with the company's new Superflow motor oil. Matchbox cars were at toy stores with little haulers. And these modified Pontiacs were tossed into kids' meals at Hardee's, official sponsor of Russ Wheeler. They made an impossible video game game for the NES. You think this is fun? There was even a theme park ride worthy of the defunct land treatment. In 1994, Days of Thunder the Ride opened at the Great America Theme Park in Santa Clara, California. One year after it opened at King's Island, the dark ride was a motion simulator that employed footage from the film made four years prior. Guests would enter the ride through the Action Theater, a large open-faced building filled with several cars and props from the film. While guests waited in line, NASCAR driver Kyle Petty would warn that there would be no flash photography, but if guests did, to get his good side. Upon entering the ride himself, guests would find a large um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What is it about this movie that makes it work? And why has it stayed with people for so long? Well, let's take a look under the hood. I'm dropping the hammer! Days of Thunder is a simple underdog story. It doesn't try to avoid tropes, but instead uses them to their fullest potential. Cole Trickle, played by Tom Cruise, is a down-on-his-luck short tracker whose cocky attitude hides his many insecurities. Cole stubbornly stumbles through his rookie season, but slowly learns to trust his much older crew chief Harry Hogg, played by Robert Duvall. Just when the two start to find success, Cole crashes into his on-track rival Rowdy Burns, played by Michael Rooker, critically injuring them both. As the two recover, a friendship develops between them, as does Cole's romantic relationship with his sexy doctor, Claire Lewicki, played by Nicole Kidman. Cole recovers first, but loses confidence in his ability, and is fired for wrecking his teammate Russ Wheeler, played by Carrie Ells. To make matters worse, Rowdy let his brain injury go unchecked, and Cole has to drive in his place to save his team. The stage is set for one climactic race, the Daytona 5 500, where Cole must defeat Russ Wheeler and his own demons to take a most satisfying checkered flag. No, you're not! The story and the production were helped in no small part by Hendrick Motorsports. When this movie was filmed in the late 1980s, Rick Hendrick's team was just beginning to find Victory Lane. The story goes that Tom Cruise asked Rick about Tim Richmond, who is partially the basis for his character. Harry Hyde, Richmond's former crew chief, was also interviewed, which is perhaps the reason that his own character, Harry Hogg, steals the show from Cruise at many opportunities opportunities. Robert Town, the screenwriter, also took inspiration from the Hendrick team itself and their struggles to get started with Jeff Bodine as their only driver. The team Trickle drives for in the film is a startup team, just like Hendrick's was, and carries logos for Rick's City Chevrolet dealership. Ice cream! But Rick Hendrick's bunch didn't just help with the writing. They provided the cars used in the film, a massive undertaking for such a young team. Between 33 and 60 cars in total, 14 of the City Chevrolet car alone, many of them with chassis 10 and 15 years old. While the cars driven by the main characters included branding from Hendrick Motorsports, others had logos and paint schemes carefully researched from other teams. Such an undertaking would be completely impossible today with technical alliances and corporate backing being what they are. And make no mistake, these cars were used. No CGI, no miniatures. Actual stunt segments were basically demolition derbies where racers like Greg Sachs and several stuntmen were asked to run virtually out of control. Eleven of these cars were completely destroyed after filming and had to be scrapped. You want me to work the pit and you drive? Still other Hendrick 
cars were filmed during races themselves, and NASCAR required those be race ready. This added a layer of intrigue to Winston Cup in late 1989 and early 1990. At Phoenix in 89, Bobby Hamilton qualified a Rowdy Burns car fifth on the grid and led five laps before the engine blew in the closing stages. That same day, Greg Sachs ran a green coal trickle car, but parked halfway through due to the handling issues caused by the two 100-pound cameras in his car, one in the right front and one in the right rear. Sachs had a much better car in 1990 when he drove another green machine in the Bush Clash. Sachs started outside pole and led four laps before Ken Schrader passed him for the win, ironically, in a Hendrick car. Bobby Hamilton and Tommy Ellis then returned for the Daytona 500, this time in a mellow yellow and Hardy's car that were not scored and only completed the first 100 miles before they pulled off the track. Sachs attempted to qualify the Superflow car at Atlanta, but failed to qualify, then started 7th the next round at Darlington before the crankshaft failed after 61 laps. Overall, the movie team performed so well that it became a new Hendrick car, number 18, that Sachs raced for the rest of the 1990 season. If the son of a bitch listened to me, we wouldn't hardly ever lose a race. Days of Thunder is not a perfect movie. Thank you. Sure, the car that's on the inside in this shot isn't the same as the one in this shot, but one of the film's strengths is how few corners were actually cut. They set up 28 cameras during the 1990 Daytona 500. That's in addition to the ones used by CBS's broadcast. There were so many cameras used, in fact, that Paramount won an award for most cameras used in a production. Somehow, they still didn't get enough footage this time, so they came back a few weeks later, built their own pit boxes, and dressed up extras in $390,000 of period-accurate uniforms. Loose is fast and on the edge of out of control. Despite some of the film's exaggerations, the viewer also learns a lot about the sport itself. Cole tells us he learned about NASCAR from ESPN. ESPN. The coverage is excellent. You'd be surprised at how much you can pick up. Which is strange because he then says... Because I don't know what the hell you're talking about. ESPN also aired the behind-the-scenes featurette a week before the film came out, and both Bob Jenkins and Dr. Jerry Punch have speaking roles in the film. Cole, did you have any idea you could run the car line up into that last turn and make it stick like that? We're 56 laps into this 200 lap event and Russ Wheeler is in the lead. We learn about Silly Season, how important sponsorship is for new teams, and what decisions they make to grow their operation. We've got ourselves a sponsor! We learn about tire wear and the unique challenges posed by heavy stock cars as opposed to open wheelers. The tires were twice as wide and the car weighed half as much. Now your car weighs twice as much and the tires are half as wide and you're burning them up. We learn about the draft and how it's used. They divide the air resistance between them. We learn the names and faces of some of the sport's biggest drivers. He's plenty capable of running that race car good, and I don't think he has any kind of effects from the accident that would uh, be a factor in the way he performs. Even Jimmy Means had a cameo before it was cut. We did the same with Cruises on the pole and I'm outside pole, and I'm talking to Cruz on the radio. I said, you do what you want to do and don't dodge me, I'll dodge you. So just do what, you know, just drive the car and do what you want to do. Producer Don Simpson got in on the action, too, appearing in a few scenes as the fictional Aldo Benedetti. Aldo basically just does this. <laughs> Incidentally, that stunt cut open the roof of this former Ken Reagan car. But above all, we learned the one thing that makes stock car racing so special from other motorsports. No, he didn't slam you, he didn't bump you, he didn't nudge you, he rubbed you. And Robin's son is racing. Those two words had the unintended effect of perhaps causing one of the biggest wrecks in the history of Daytona. Ten days after the film's release came the Pepsi 400, where, on the very first lap, Greg Sachs, in the new Hendrick car, triggered a massive pileup exiting the trioval. Oh no, Sachs is in trouble! And take Penny with him. And we're gonna have a terrific crash here as nearly all the field is gonna be involved in this crash. There are only about 10 or 12 cars that survive this melee. Robin Drake! Then there's the cinematography by Ward Russell, the sound design, and above all, Hans Zimmer's soundtrack. <laughs> it 
In interviews since, Zimmer said he was embarrassed by the soundtrack, believing it to be inferior to his later works. There wasn't even an official release until just recently. Before that, you had to do what I did, buy a bootleg copy off eBay and meet some guy in front of the local 7-Eleven to pick it up like a weird owl trying to buy the Star Wars Holiday Special. I can't slow down! On top of all of this, there's a wonderful cast in this movie. Like I said, Robert Duvall steals the show as Harry, but everyone has their moments here. Randy Quaid plays what is basically basically a young Rick Hendrick, a car dealer looking to break into racing. We see his frustrations early on. We end up looking like a monkey f***ing a football out there. Then there's Russ Wheeler, the Carrie Ells character I mentioned earlier. <laughs> I always wonder why Wheeler was being such a jerk to Cole during this movie. He comes in as a relief driver after the Burns wreck, then when he comes back stays on to drive a new second car. You'd think he'd be happy about this, but from there on he just antagonizes Cole like it's something personal. Makes me wonder if there was a scene left out. I'm doing it, Harry! Sure, Days of Thunder is a big, dumb action movie that exaggerates just how many gears are in a transmission or how fast the cars are going around the track, but you know what? It's fun. And you know where we're missing some fun movies these days? You gotta look in the past here to actually get some entertainment anymore. And all the hyperbole that you have in this film is just there to get you as excited as it can. That's why it's the greatest racing movie ever made. And much like the era in which it was made, it's a film the likes of which we may never see again. And that is what makes Days of Thunder so awesome. Of course, not everyone agrees. I mean, everyone has a right to be completely wrong about something. But would you believe that a NASCAR driver is one of them? And the film that he thinks is the best of all time is this? The degree to which you're awake is the degree to which you've never been that alive. Being that alive creates an experience that's exceedingly powerful. And it's the reason people probably go back into the boxing ring when they shouldn't. And the reason guys who are too old continue to race. Because except for sex and good food, there's nothing like it after that.